Dude, inf- here's the really sad part. Inflation hurts every, every. Yeah. It helps a few. Who does it help? What's up, everybody? Man, I just recorded an incredible episode with Michael Zuber of One Rental at a Time. You're not going to want to miss this one. In this episode, we're going to discuss topics like how you can reach financial independence through real estate investing, the proper financing you can use, and the different options you have. We're going to discuss how to use seller financing creatively to get yourself more deals. We're going to discuss some of Michael's crazy stories, one of which involves a man with a hammer and some crazy characters. That's towards the end of the episode, so make sure you stay tuned and catch all those crazy stories. We've got some interesting stuff like how AI is going to affect the real estate investor and real estate investing landscape. And one really interesting topic, which is, is Jay-Z smart for taking on a mortgage on his multi-million dollar mansion? This episode's really gonna deliver the goods. Michael's awesome, the conversation was great. Before we dive in, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you can catch more topics like this that help you make wise money decisions, help you build wealth, and help you get to financial independence so you can do work that's meaningful to you that changes the world in a meaningful way. Enjoy the episode, smash that like, and let's get going. What's up, everybody? I am excited to be back and have a really great guest. Some of you may already know him. He's making a big impact with his show. My guest today is Michael Zuber, and Michael runs a show, One Rental at a Time. If you are not checking that show out, go check that out. He's got really great content coming out every day on real estate investing. This guy is financially independent. He's a cool dude. He's putting out great content. He's a guy you should know if you're into real estate investing and becoming financially independent. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. That's a great, that's a great introduction. I haven't been called a cool dude in a long time. So I (laughs) I like, I like that little zinger. That was good. I got got to get that ringtone. Well, you know, cool is in the eye of the beholder. And for me, real estate investors, financially independent, putting out content, that makes my list. So there you go. uh, It was like running into you at the recent Think Media conference that they did. Uh, Michael and I are both involved there learning from Sean. Shout out to Sean. Sean, this is cool. These are two of your students here making content, following following your teaching. So hopefully we're making Sean proud with all this. But Michael, I'm excited to dive into your story. And for the audience, um, we're going to run through some, some of the tips and tricks that Michael learned along his way of reaching financial independence through real estate investing. Let's dive into your story, Michael. Tell us how this all happened for you, how you got into real estate, and I guess the process you used to reach financial independence. Yeah, so I guess in order to tell the story so it resonates with most of the audience, I'm obviously, I'm Generation X. I'm not a boomer, although some of the haters like to call me that. So what does that mean if you're Gen X? You were likely raised to go to school, get a good job, make a lot of money, buy nice things. This was how we were taught. So I followed the path that was outlined by my mom where I got a, a college degree. Uh, I went back and got an MBA. So I went for two more years and got a master's in business administration. And I was climbing the corporate ladder. Uh, I'm old enough to have been investing before the dot-com crash. I successfully turned seven grand into almost 200 grand. Uh, so I had a good time. Unfortunately, I lost 80% of that right around the age of 30. And I realized that I, I was a gambler. I, I wasn't even a stock trader, right? I started doing the right things, reading financials, doing all of that. But uh, when you're in the dot-com hysteria and everything's going up, you suddenly feel like a genius. There's probably some younger listeners now that had the same thing, unfortunately, happen to them around crypto. Right? I've been there. I know what it feels like to to go from very little to a lot. And then also, unfortunately, from a lot to very little. I've been there. And that's when real estate hit my radar. I was 30 years old. I was a failure in my eyes because I just lost $160,000. And I stumbled across a book in my age group. It's called uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm. And it changed my life. It, it, dude, I was 30 years old. I owned a home. I had an MBA. I was an accountant. I have an econ degree. 
And this freaking book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Unlock Rental Properties. Nobody in my life to that point had any rentals. Nobody in that, that point in my life knew that real estate was a path to build wealth. Um, you know, it was, it's crazy that that one simple book was the unlock to send me on a, you know, 15 year journey to financial freedom. Right. So we, we read that book, we read other books. We, we end up buying a house and, you know, that was 2002. We, we had eight houses at the peak of the market. Unlike a lot of people who did not sell, we sold at the peak. We did what's called a 1031 exchange. We got out of houses and we moved to apartments then the crash happens and I'm writing for bigger pockets at the time and I'm raising private money and uh, we're buying foreclosures everywhere. And, and, you know, suddenly, you know, fast forward, the wife retires 2013, I retire 2018 and uh, yeah, financial freedom happened. One rent at a time. That's amazing. And I love that you did the, you used the 1031 exchange to take your, your, the table and move that over to apartments. Do you still own apartments now? Yeah, we, we own a little bit of everything right now. We we okay. were very single family oriented the first five years, four years, then multifamily, then single family. Now we just buy what the best deal is. Uh, I suspect over the next two years, we will mainly be buying multifamily just because of all the pain coming yeah. from syndications. Uh, but we've only been buying residential for the last four years. So very much residential the last four. I suspect bigger multifamily the next two or three. I just buy where the deals are. I'm not, I don't care where it is. I just want the best deal. Smart man. You're looking for opportunity and you are zigging when everyone else is zagging. And it's, it's recognizing opportunity is the name of the game in real estate investing. When something gets overheated, you should look elsewhere. Don't force a deal if the numbers don't pencil, right? Gosh. And, you know, when rates were low, the residential stuff was working. And and I mean, I remember looking at multifamily a couple of years ago and I couldn't get the deals to pencil. And, oh. and, uh, and people were just buying these things at these insanely low cap rates. And, uh, and now there's, there's a lot of pain in the commercial markets mm -hmm. and some deer deals are going to materialize with some people that are having to refi at the exact worst moment as these rates have gone up. And um, I've really been enjoying the content on your show lately covering these, these trending yeah. topics. And I want to get into some of that, but I want to dive into a little, um, a little bit of your story on what you just said. Um, so this show is about achieving financial independence, uh, making smart money decisions, helping people get unstuck, and when I say unstuck, unstuck from jobs they feel stuck in and unstuck financially, help them create financial independence and move into work that they love where they can make a positive impact on the world. Real estate investing is a major component of that, along with other types of investments. Mm -hmm. Tell us, where do you invest your wealth? Where do you, what do you, what is your diversification strategy? Do you, are you an all real estate guy? Do you have uh, index funds, real estate? Crypto, like, what is your strategy with that? No, I, I, I believe what uh, the late great um, Charlie Munger believes about diversification. Diversification is a way to do basically nothing. I think that I think the path to getting wealthy is remarkably simple. Step one, it's only three steps. Step one, you have to create disposable income. Disposable income becomes the seeds to future wealth. How do you create disposable income? Well, you either make more money, you spend less money, or you do both. Those are the only options. Okay, so that's step one. Step two, you have to become an amazing investor at something. I chose real estate. You could choose stocks. You could choose crypto. You could choose classic cars. You could choose wine. You could choose, I don't give a rat's ass what you choose, but become the best of the best at that thing and then do it for 10 years. That's it. That's all it takes. You're wealthy. Simple. So I'm not a big diversification guy. I did uh, in 2018 take 1% of my net worth and buy crypto. I bought uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum. That was 45%, 45%, and then 10% in some stupid altcoin, altcoins that went to zero. Uh, but I do have 1%, and I have it there as an insurance policy. It's up significantly from 2018 levels. Um, but I'm not a 
dude, it's just an insurance policy. If it goes to zero, I don't care. If it goes to a million, I really don't care. Um, but yeah, I do have an insurance policy there. I do have some gold and silver. Same reason, insurance policy. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I, I also have the lion's share. Well, I don't, you didn't say this explicitly, but it's what I'm taking from what you said. I have the lion's share of my, my asset assets producing income in real estate and then i have some crypto which is a an insurance policy on the dollar <laughs> going down uh you know bitcoin it has been outpacing all this stuff over time now there's these massive volatility swings with it so i wouldn't want to have to be counting on that monthly for income sure. but as a place to just place some money and if the dollar just really gets in trouble and that might be an inflation hedge for you, but um, that's not what I'm I'm banking on for my retirement or anything. So, um, okay, you've done what a lot of people are trying to do. You've reached financial independence using real estate investing. What is your advice to someone who is wanting to do the same thing? You hit hit on this a second ago. What is your advice if they're just wanting to use real estate? Uh, you, need to you need to realize it's a ten year journey. It's just ten years. I mean, some people could do it eight, some people do it in 12. I just tell people it's 10 years. Most people in today's world want it yesterday. Yeah. And that's not how it works. You, I also believe that inflation is a feature, not a bug. So if you believe that inflation is a feature, not a bug, the best thing to buy is uh, an asset that cash flows that you could get fixed rate 30 year debt on and then allow the debt to be paid off by someone else while the rent goes up and your cash flow grows. It's a real simple formula. Yeah, it's unfortunately just takes ten years, and I just tell people it takes ten years. You know, the and oh by the way, the first five years suck. It's slow. It's where you make mistakes. It's where you learn that people lie to you and people steal. Um, yeah, you know the first five the first five years are testing you and and it tries to kick you out. Yeah. I promised myself I would make sure and get some stories from you because listeners love stories. I love hearing stories. Give me a story that happened during that first five years. I'll if, tell you. That you I'll can you think the, of that we would that would make a big impact. I'll tell you the story of my very first tenant. Forget five years. Very <laughs> first tenant. 1818 Norris Drive East. I no longer own it, so you can go look it up. We buy it for 107 grand. We find a tenant who rents it for eleven hundred. Credit check, reference check, job history. Everything checks the box. We have a property manager, so we're not even self-managing. We're paying a PM to make sure it's done right. Uh, the couple moves in, and they never pay rent again. Turns out they get divorced while in the first month the wife takes off to New Mexico. The husband is not happy about this and decides to stop going to work and to stop paying rent. Now, I'm in California. So it takes me three months to get them out. Mm -hmm. I have to pay my mortgage for three months. I have to pay an attorney a thousand bucks. And I have to walk through this house that's now been destroyed by a drunk idiot who's not happy he got divorced. Mm. And we have to spend 15 grand. Oh. So that's my first experience with my first rental. Have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> and you immediately thought, I got to do a lot more of this. <laughs> well, well, it's funny. I drove to that. I gotta remember that experience is right after losing eighty percent of my wealth. Mm. I, I lost, and so I'm defeated. I'm depressed. I'm ready to walk away. Olivia, my better and smarter half, goes, "Did we do anything wrong?" And we truly didn't. We did. We checked every box. There's just no box that says, "Are you going to get divorced?" Not on the application. So she says, "Let's try one more time." And oh, by the way. The next tenant never missed a payment, never was a problem, was in the property until we sold it. We 1031'd it three years later. Um, and again, that house we 1031'd into an apartment building we still own today, which more, has more than doubled. The cash flow is a stupid number. And it turns out to be a great story, but how many people would have been washed out after that first, you know? horrible event so yeah you want you want a good story i'll tell you about my first tenant every time yeah i love that and i i don't love what happened to you but i love i love the, the the retelling of the story and the fact that you kept going because 
I don't know one single successful real estate investor that doesn't have stories like that. I've got a lot of them as well. Yeah. And it's going to happen to you, whether it happens on your first deal or later, uh, you're going to have something like that happen to you. And it is, it is just a part of doing this. But the important thing is that you kept taking the swings. You stayed at the, you kept going up to bat. You kept taking the swings and you figured it out. And now look where you are. You're helping tons of people do the same thing. And man, what a game changer to figure out that real estate investing can change your life if you do it right and give it enough time, right? You, you don't get rich overnight with it. You can. You can hit a grand slam on a deal and make a lot of money, but you don't want to count on that, right? It's, it's getting in there and taking the reps and learning, and it takes some time. But 10 years really isn't that long when you consider what kind of wealth this can build, right? Yeah, I know. 10 years is, well, it really depends, right? I've been lucky enough to help lots of people. If you're telling somebody who's 21 yeah. that it's going to take 10 years, they're, they're like, dude, that's half my life. <laughs> but yeah. if you tell somebody who's 40, they're like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Right? So it, 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 you do have to have that. But yeah, 10, like I love talking to high school seniors, like 18 year olds, 19 year olds. I'm like, how many of you can live on two grand a month? They all raise their hand because they don't. Yeah. But I'm like, if you really can live on two grand a month, you could be financially free by the time you're 25. Yeah. It's not that hard to make two grand a month passively, whether it's with real estate or what Sean teaches or or any other way. Yeah. It's just that we let life get in the way, right? I, I went from making nothing to six figures, but I spent I I allowed life creep to happen. I was 30 year old making six figures, spending every penny. What a fool was I. Um yeah, I made, I, you know, I, I wasted my 20s. And I wish oh, yeah. It's not. Yeah. You know, you mentioned reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I did the same thing after I had my MBA, after I had spent time in corporate America and figured out I didn't want to do that. I read, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it just blows my mind, right? I'm like, wow, this is, it's so simple what I need to do. But he just laid it out in this way that just opened my eyes to it. And it's, it's the same with a lot of other people. And it's like, okay, it's pretty simple you know, buy an asset that that's cash flow positive, mm -hmm. let the, the renter pay it off, let it go up in value and use the tax breaks you get from owning real estate, you know, to your favor, live below your means mm -hmm. and then trade the houses up for hotels as they gain equity over yeah, time. So just play in monopoly, just green, just green houses, red them up. Yeah. I love it. Let's talk about um, real quick. What is your investment criteria, and how has that changed considering the headwinds that are in the market right now? What's what defines a deal that you want to do? Uh, so I'm a very simple guy. I I only want to know how hard my money is working. So I have this thing called yield. Some people call it return on capital. Some people call it cash on cash. But I want to look at how much cash is going into a deal, down payment, make ready, closing cost, and then how much money I get out expected yearly cash flow. And that's just a division and it turns into a percentage. So at different points in my career, I would accept 8% yield, sometimes 15% yield, uh, sometimes 12. It just depends on the market. I want to know. I do the work every day, so I know what average is. Today, average in my market's about 6.5%. So I only want to do 8.5%, 9 10%. I, I only want to do great deals. I only have to do one deal a year, two deals a year. Uh, I don't need a dozen deals. So I just look for whatever the best yield is. And sometimes it's houses, sometimes it's apartments. And um, yeah, I don't overcomplicate it. Pretty simple. Yeah, guy. I love that. And what is your what is your strategy on financing your deals? I know as you are now more public facing with your current show, private money must be approaching you. Um, you know, you have traditional financing, you've got all these different ways to do things, hard money. What's your advice to people that are trying to level up their real estate investing game with their financing options? Yeah. Getting access to capital is a big deal. Uh, and you're right. Yeah. Once you become public facing, you become good at what you do. You can raise private money pretty easily. Um, and I've documented a couple of different times doing that. Um, but really where I think we're going is really, un you got to understand your different financing options. I think for the first, I don't know, five years, I was just a bank guy. I didn't know any difference, right? Get a first mortgage, 20% down. Then uh, 2010 happens and banks don't want to lend to me anymore because I'm a real estate investor. And then I figure out hard money. 
And then I figure out private learning. And then I figure out DSCR. And um, you just got to realize you're never done learning. I've been in this game 20 some years and you're just never done learning. I think the thing that I look for or will be looking for in the next two years is seller finance. We've mm. done, I don't know, six, eight, 10 deals, seller financing, some seven figures. But I think with what's coming in the commercial space, all the syndicators blowing up, all those low cap, you know, two year IO deals blowing up, I'm going to be able to find some seller finance deals uh, where I can quote unquote overpay, but get a, a much better rate. I, I, I look at it this way. I'll pay your price. I'll pay yesterday's price if I can have yesterday's rate. Mm. Uh, so that's something I'm looking forward to doing. I love that. I have leveraged seller financing, got one this year, and it is out there. Uh, oh, yeah. I think that's that scares people because they're not familiar with how to do it. But you can get some really great deals using seller financing, people who just want to get out of their properties, and they will help you assume the, yeah. the low rate financing they have. I know, you know, people like guys like Pace Morby, they teach this. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is an available tool that should be in your tool chest as a real estate investor, because with rates being as high as they are now, you can go, you can still get, and, and sometimes you can get a lower, you can get today's price at yesterday's financing, right? Which you is even could. better. But, but to your point, um, you get yesterday's price with yesterday's financing, as long as it's cash flowing, then... Um, you just walked into a deal that you had to put very little down on, right? And you're taking awesome. ownership of assets and you get the depreciation and all those benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah. G give us an example of a seller financing deal that you've done. Yeah. So I think one that, that often uh, people like to hear about, uh, it was a single family home. Uh, the gentleman at the time wanted 120 grand. Unfortunately, uh, the, the, the house in perfect condition was worth a hundred, mm. but he wanted one twenty, and I kept trying to tell him and tell him and tell him and tell him. And finally I went to him and said, well, the, I'll pay one twenty if you give me a 30 year fixed rate mortgage at 0% interest. So my payment is all principal for the duration of the loan. And lo and behold, he said, yes. Now, why did he say yes? I I think he said yes because he wanted to tell his boys on the golf course that he got some stupid kid <laughs> to overpay for his house. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you he never told them, I got a 0% 30-year mortgage. Yeah. Right? And he, here's the deal. My plan anytime I buy something is to hold forever. So do I really care that I overpaid by 20 grand given I got 30-year money at zero? I don't care. Right. I'm going to hold the thing forever. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the possibility. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities out there. Yeah. And you know, the, 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 the strategy, right. Is as that thing goes up and inflation pays that loan off for you, it's just a, a matter of time until you're right side up on that. And oh, yeah. And again, I don't really care. Zero percent interest. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, since I've owned the house, the house is now worth two fifty, two sixty. But more importantly, again, I don't really care about equity, right? Net worth nonsense. the The rent on the property has gone from nine ninety five to seventeen fifty. Yeah, my payment hasn't changed. It's all principal. So, and oh by the way, I'm not paying that thing off early. I guarantee you that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned something a second ago. I wanted to come back to, which is one of the one of the major perks to taking advantage of seller financing and grabbing as much real estate cash flow and real estate as you can. And that is inflation, right? Real estate is an inflation hedge. So if you own no assets and you rent an apartment, you've got your job making 50,000 a year, whatever you're getting left in the dust as inflation is causing your purchasing power to go down while your income is not keeping up with the rising cost of living. When you don't own any assets, you don't have a house and your rent goes from 1200 to 2000 over the yeah. course of two or three years, you're getting left in the dust. And this is really scary stuff that's going on. And it's going to absolutely eviscerate the middle class. 
And that's why it's so imperative that you own assets. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, again, dude, getting wealthy is remarkably simple. I didn't yeah. say it was easy. I said it was simple. Um, you got to create disposable income. You got to become a good at something. You got to do it for 10 years because inflation, dude, if, here's the really sad part. Inflation hurts everyone. Every yeah. It helps a few. Who does it help? Asset owners. It yep. really helps asset owners who are indexed with fixed rate debt, 30 years, yep. the, and produce cash flow. Because yes, taxes will go up. Yes, insurance will go up. But generally speaking, rent's going to go up faster than all of those, and you're left ahead. It's, yeah. I, you know, it, it. you could say it's not fair. Life's not fair. But yeah, owning assets, particularly if you can finance them with 30 year debt, very little down that cash flow. I don't know any other better way to get rich. It's just that simple. And that's what we've done on the lion's share of our portfolio is everything's locked in at lower 30 year fixed conventional rates. Uh, we have one commercial deal that's locked in. I think it's on a I think it's on a 10 year um, because it's a commercial property and we literally couldn't get that conventional 30 year fixed financing on that. How do, how do you finance your apartments? Um, when it comes to the term and the, yeah. You know, that kind of stuff? So typically speaking, we'll do five or 10 years. We, we try to get the longest term possible, but something that a lot of people missed, um, there was a time, uh, during the, um, pandemic where you could get a DSCR loan. Yeah. At, at 3.99, that was fixed for 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. I got I got those done with Velocity Mortgage, and they are on apartments. Wow, so, that's great. Yeah, you just got to pay attention. You got to be out in the game. You can get DRCR loans on commercial property. They can be fixed for 30 years. So that's what we did. Now, in today's rates, I wouldn't do that. I'd, I'd go get a five-year term hoping that rates got better. But yeah, we did a rate and term refis on our apartments to 30 year fixed rate money, sub four, sub four. Ooh, that's killer. Okay. You and I know what a DSCR loan is. Let's, let's go over that for everyone who's not familiar with what that is. Explain to us what a DSCR loan is and how that could help you when financing a property. Yeah. DSCR loans is just kind of an alternative to banking. DSCR standing for debt service coverage ratio. Where you're going to go buy a home, they're going to look at your income, the appraisal, things like that. A debt service coverage ratio from a non-bank uh, is basically going, hey, does the building produce enough income to pay the mortgage? A debt service coverage ratio of one means the building produces enough to make the payment. And that's it. There's nothing extra. 1.25 means there's some extra. 1.5 means there's more extra. Something that's like 0.8 means you got to come out of pocket. They're not going to typically do those loans, right? They want coverage. Um, so again, it's just one of the answers to uh, lending options because not everybody is bankable. Real estate investors, small business owners, they're not bankable like a W-2 wage earner. Yeah. Uh, so that's why these other alternative lending options are out there. Yeah, I love the DSCR loan and and that's definitely an option when you're looking to lock in your financing on your properties. So smart of you guys to lock in a 30 year on your apartments. That is amazing. I was unaware that it, that was being offered at that time. That's great. Yep. Lot. Yeah. It was uh, glad, glad uh, shout out Stephen Dow velocity mortgage for helping Olivia and I do that. And yeah, it's something we come with all uh, every week on the channel. He comes back every Thursday to talk about what's going on. So lots of people took advantage of it, but more could have. Yeah. So, Let's shift gears, and I want to get on another question that'll that will be interesting to to a lot of people. I think there's a school of thought of pay your primary residence off, have no debt on your primary residence. Mm -hmm. Got people like Jay Z, mm -hmm. oodles of money, mm -hmm. and has a mortgage on his home. Oh yeah, smart or not smart? Well, let's talk about Jay Z as an example. Clearly, has enough cash where he could write a check. Yep. But what, what happens in Jay-Z's example, because he's in the top 1% of 1%, is banks are fighting for his business. So Jay-Z probably got a 2.9% interest rate on his house, something stupid low, something lower than you and I could get. Yeah. <laughs> and what Jay-Z is basically saying is, hey, I could use this $20 million 
And shoot, Jay-Z could put it in, in treasuries and earn 5%. So why would he why would he pay it off? He could borrow 20, pay three, invest 20, make five. He makes the spread. He's basically making his payment. So uh, what Jay-Z and Jay-Z's financial analysts are helping him with is um, how to use capital appropriately. But now let's go to mom and dad. I believe most people should look to have a free and clear house as they get close to retirement. I just think for most of us, that's our most biggest expense. And I have seen people in their 60s having to work at Walmart and Target and whatnot because they have to pay the mortgage because health insurance takes out a big bite of their Social Security. So I do think it's prudent to pay off the primary residence as you age. I don't think it's a goal that you should have in your 20s because you're still, you know, you're, you still got time on your side. Um, but yeah, so I, I do think there's sometimes, you know, examples where you shouldn't like Jay-Z, but for most people, I would think having a free and clear home at 65 would be a good idea. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I have always had debt on my home. Um, but as I age, I think that as I get closer to retirement age, I get more and more, um, pro paying it completely off even though I may still have debt on cash flowing real estate. For sure. Um, And to your point, it's not a, um, you know, you can, you can make a higher cash on cash return elsewhere, but it's the, uh, it's the security of knowing your older age that I'm not going to lose my home if something happens because it's paid off. Right. And you've got Mm -hmm. that equity sitting there. You could tap into in the case of an emergency, yeah. Um, but I 100% agree with you. Jay-Z is making a smart decision having that mortgage because he's got so many investment opportunities around him, even in just treasuries. He could just yeah. sock it in there and he's making money off the difference, off the spread. Yeah. Off the so spread. I'm with you on that. Cool. Let's talk about another trending thing in our, our country and our world right now. That's AI. Mm. How do you see AI in, uh, influencing and impacting real estate investing and real estate investors over the next 10, 20 years? Well, I think, well, first off, a step back. I think AI will undoubtedly um, cause job loss. Uh, I also think AI will be responsible for job creation. Uh, I think there will be new jobs created because of AI, prompt engineers being the most likely example. So there's some of that. But when we just talk about real estate investors specifically, uh, I think AI is going to allow us to collect and synthesize data much quicker. I think AI will help us uh, market better. I think one of the things that that AI will help people do is simply write better. If you want to write a letter to an owner or market a property or write a book, for heaven's sakes, I think AI will help with all of that. Uh, But AI will not bring the human level, right? It's not It's not going to be your personality. People at the end of the day buy from people they know and trust. AI may open a door, may help you interact, but an AI is not going to help me buy a home from a seller. That's, that's we, we buy belly to belly or you know across the table. Um, so I think AI will impact a lot of un- other industries a lot more than real estate investors. I think I think AI is a tool already and probably becomes a more effective tool in the future. It probably helps us look at deals because AI will be get better at doing math and articulating, you know, variables. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not worried about AI replacing what what I, who I am and what I do, but um yeah, that's my initial thought. I agree with you. I think AI is going to cause job loss in some areas. There's going to be a lot of job creation in others. It will it will integrate as a a better way of doing some processes that we're doing. Mm-hmm. But you think the ownership of real estate is not going away, right? The ownership of real estate that's that's got to be it's going to be owned by people, and so owning assets. I believe owning assets over the next 50 years is going to be absolutely required thing for wealth creation. Um, as a, it's, a, it's the only way to get there. I mean, getting well, I mean, you go back and look at the last 200 years, there's no reason that the wealth formula is going to change 
over the next 200 years. Disposable income becomes seeds, become good at something, do it for 10 years. It's it doesn't change because of AI. None of that changes. It's all absolutely, insane. absolutely, absolutely. Let's talk about one more really great story, a uh, real estate investing story you have, either something that you did that you thought was a, a huge mistake that you would that you've learned from going forward, or maybe your best deal ever, something like that. Um well, let's see. Which one of my stories? Uh, I'll tell you two, actually. I'll give you a story I call the hammer story and uh, buying directly from a bank. Which one do you want first? Let's do the hammer story. So I had an apartment building. Uh, a tenant came in to pay rent. That tenant didn't happen to be on the lease. Uh, <laughs> we said, oh, by the way, it's okay. We just need to add you to the lease because we thought it was a roommate situation. It was a two bedroom, so totally fine. We just wanted to get this individual added to the lease. So we did not take the payment. We simply gave him an application to fill out so we could add him to the lease. He comes back the next day with the lease, again with rent, which we did not accept because he's not yet approved. We then go through the application and realize that everything on his application is a lie except his name. Turns out this guy is a criminal of some kind. Oh, man. So we now tell the current tenant that uh he has to go at which point the tenant tells us he's no longer living there because of this guy which oh by the way a lot of fun so now we have to start an eviction this mm-hmm. gentleman is now pissed off he knows he's got to go he doesn't want to deal with the cops so he's got to go so little did we know he issued a, a party he invited all his buddies to come over and told them to bring a hammer so he uh, turns on the music real loud, creates a destruction, and all the guests start putting holes in the wall, drywall, breaking, uh, breaking toilets, breaking the bathtub, breaking um, uh, the, the tile in the kitchen with their hammers that he was told to break. So the cops come. The cops arrest lots of people, including him, because a moron was there. So lots of people go to jail. He had felony, whatever they're called, and he goes to jail for a long time. I think he's still in jail. And um, so that problem is over that night. Everybody's gone. Lots of people arrested. But of course, now I have a totally destroyed small apartment. And, uh, you know, 20 grand later, the hammer story is gone. But yeah, there's my hammer story. What a nightmare. Yeah, it happened. (laughs) That's incredible. Wow. Got it yeah. re-rented cash flow. Are you managing no, are you managing that yourself or did you have a third party manager? No, we 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 have it managed since we had one house, we've had a property manager since day one. It's not not nice. my headache. Yeah. Nice. So buying directly from a bank. So the second story is I get a phone call from a bank president. I don't think it's a bank president because I never had a bank president call. I thought one of my boys was tricking me. Right? I'm like, who's punking me? Sure enough, uh, eventually I I think it's possible, right? I'm I'm still thinking in my head, there's no way a bank president's calling me. It's got to be a VP or whatever. Yeah. So we agree to meet at the property. Turns out to be the property right next door to one I'm already working on. And little story, little known, it is the bank president. He's wearing a full three-piece suit in the summer in Fresno, which is hot. I don't know how he did it, but he did. And he basically goes, we see what you're doing at that property. We happen to own this one. We will give it to you for the same price. No, no money down, below market interest rate. The only thing we ask is you put fifty thousand dollars in our bank uh, to help with the remodel cost. And you know, the only thing I could say is yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. please. So yeah, that was my phone call that I thought was a prank. Uh, turned out to be another apartment building we got right next to another apartment building we own, uh, right directly from a bank. Probably the easiest transaction I've ever done. What has transpired with that property since then? How much has that gone up in value? What's the cash flow like? It's gone up 500% from the price point we bought it. Probably more than 500, but let's be conservative, 500. Cash flow has gone from, gosh, cash flow is up 300% probably. No. Yeah. And it was a no, and a no money down. No money down, below market interest rate. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow, that is insane. Yeah, I would have thought I was being punked as well. That it happened. <laughs> yeah, it's like, why is this guy calling me? Yeah, <laughs> how is this? How is this possible? Sometimes amazing deals like that come to you, and you just gotta take it and run. You're like, I'd be an 
not do this, right? So yeah, right place, right. He wanted he wanted to sell because the other thing I did is I'm a good steward of capital. We were taking care of the building next door, which happened to be in worse condition than his. And yeah. he was like, hey, I, I want that guy. This guy cares. So there you go. Yeah. And, you know, from his perspective, he's got a deal that he wants to offload as fast as possible. He doesn't want to lose money on it. He's trying to mitigate that. Yep. So his solution, he sees you there. He's like, hey, this guy could take it and run with it. And it was a win-win, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So Absolutely. I love that. Well, Michael, this has been uh, an amazing episode. I, I really appreciate you sharing your stories, your insight. I love what you're doing on your show. How can people connect with you and find out more about you? Uh, I've done very few things right in life. One of them is everything I do is one rental at a time. YouTube, Instagram, books, website. It's all the same. One rental at a time. Awesome. Guys, go check out Michael's YouTube channel. Um, got daily content coming out there. Also, link up with him on Instagram. Check out his book. Michael, man, it's been awesome. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, I hope we can do this again soon. You got it. Thanks, buddy. All right, man.